I'm going to start today with an awkward question for you. The question is, take a look at what you're wearing today. Of course, it looks good. It also feels good. But is it good? Um, what if I were to say that what you're wearing today is the second dirtiest thing in the world? Of course not. <laughs> But this is exactly what a leading fashion designer told an audience in New York last year. The clothing industry is the second largest polluter in the world, second only to oil. Throughout the life cycle of a garment, from manufacture to the use, and finally the disposal, lots and lots of natural resources, energy, and water go into the making of what you're wearing. And where does it all end up? In our frenzied sort of con consumption of fast fashion, that chasing of sale after sale, especially this last week, we've had a plethora of sales. We're buying like there's no tomorrow. And this is what our wardrobes are looking like. And where do they finally end up? Do you remember the landfill at Devnar that was burning last winter. Well, landfills like that, where they become waste, or they land up on our shores in ports all over India, where we're getting a lot of the secondhand clothing from developed countries. And 50% of that can be reused and sold. 50% of it hopefully is recycled. But we need to think carefully about the impact that what we're wearing is making on the planet, the impact that it's having on the energy resources, on the depletion of these resources, and on millions of people who are involved throughout the supply chain of fashion. So is it all a grim future? One of the things that I just wanted to mention as I see the smoke coming out of the Devnar landfills is a very scary statistic. In March of, 2000, of this very year, 2016, um, it was said that global carbon dioxide levels have crossed the danger level. They're now 400 parts to a million. And the last time that this happened, people no longer existed on this planet, or rather, people didn't populate this planet. It was prehistoric geological time. So it's a very scary statistic, and I didn't want to bring in the doom and gloom of that, because the other thing that they say is that it's also a point of no return. But we're doing all our best, um, and I'm urging all of you to join in that, to bring it back to 350 um, parts per million. What is being done? Creative people all over the world are beginning to think differently. You have very interesting movements that are coming in from the world of design, technology, and business. One of the things that people are starting to do is to stop being consumers and to start becoming makers. It's called the maker movement. People are beginning to make things from local materials that they find around them from the wool from the farm next door, from all sorts of things, even waste that they find around us. And they're using traditional skills like knitting and sewing and weaving and um, even high-tech skills like the new 3D printers, the laser cutters to make jewelry and to make clothes. And this is a movement that is very akin to something that Gandhiji advocated nearly a century ago where he talked about the making, the spinning, and the weaving of your own cloth as a way to gain independence from foreign cloths that we were consuming and that we were very dependent upon. So they're becoming self-reliant. And in that self-reliance itself is a new kind of world. They're also making surplus. And technology is opening itself up through e-commerce websites to connecting these makers, these creators, these tinkerers, these inventors, to consumers all over the world. And while these consumers have been looking at generic, mass-produced, 
those made in China things that we find everywhere or even made in India. There's a new thing happening. People are looking for one-offs. They're looking for handmade. They're looking to reconnect with other people. And they're also looking to have things made personally for themselves, customizing things, um, making bespoke and made to order things on websites like Etsy. It's a new change that's happening and business also is looking at it. There is a new kind of business model that's emerging, one that we adopt, which is not a not-for-profit, neither is it a for-profit, but the motive is not just profit. The idea is to put the needs of people, the needs of the planet that we just talked about before profit, and to create communities of people who together sort of grow. And what's very exciting is that while these enterprises like ours doesn't have big money, what we lack in that, we more than make up for in the passion and the energy that people bring to work every day. They really look forward to coming to work because they, they're working on something that they care about. And so I think there are signs of hope. And with this global perspective, I'd like to bring in the Indian perspective. Where are we in relation to all of this? We're very lucky that in India, we have craft communities and the largest concentration of craft in the world, um, which is diverse, which is colorful, which varies from region to region. And in this global perspective of what we just talked about, there is so much that can be contributed through the craft economy of India. We still have makers. We don't have to become makers ourselves, although that would be nice. But we still have makers who in their own communities are making things. They're keeping their traditional skills alive. And like I'll talk to about later, they're also learning new skills like design and entrepreneurship that's taking them to cities like ours and the world outside. However, this statistic really bothered me. In 2013, the share that India has of the global market in handmade and handicraft, which is worth more than $400 billion, is less than 2%. That represents an enormous opportunity. That represents hope. And how can we keep our craft skills alive? Another thing that's happening, which is that the UN and countries who are part of the UN are also looking at new models for development. And our craft economy is aligned beautifully to that. So last year, the UN um, launched what they, what they now call the Global Goals, the Global Sustainable Development Goals. And this is completely different from the previous way in which development was measured, which is the gross domestic product, the sum total of the goods and services that are produced in a country uh, per year. And instead, it's looking at what is the well-being of the ordinary people in the country. And there are measures like no poverty, the end of hunger, gender equality, economic and social growth, even responsible consumption. So I want to look at some of these that are in particular really relevant to the Indian craft economy. Let's take no poverty and zero hunger. Did you know that the craft industry employs the second largest group of people, second only to agriculture? So that's tens of millions of people who are employed in the craft industry. And of that, let's take gender equality. More than 50% of these people are women. Women who make for themselves, who make for their home, who make for their children, and who are making surplus enough for a market. The other day, I was in um, the northeast of India where a lot of women get widowed very young. And, um, you know, they have the loin loom that they strap to their waist. 
and they were saying that they weave during the extra hours that they have from farming in order that they can sell what they make to get cash to finance their children's education. So that's amazing, the kind of powerful positions that women's livelihoods have created in India. The next one is decent work and economic growth. And this is a story of Pabi Ben and her husband Lakshman. Pabi Ben is an extraordinary woman. She's the first craft entrepreneur to come out of Gujarat as a woman. She's also got another kind of title, a newfangled title, which is that she's an artisan, designer, entrepreneur. She comes from the Rabari community where they used to embroider for themselves. And the elders 20 years ago in their community banned the women from embroidering because they were making dowry uh, goods that took so long, they were competing with each other. And by the time, you know, the woman was married, but by the time she could go to her um, in-laws, she was already in her 30s. So the elders banned dowry, both jewelry as well as embroidery for themselves, but they didn't ban the, the use of embroidery for the market. So they continue to embroider. But for themselves, one of the interesting adaptations that they made was every home has a sewing machine. And so this bag you, you see um, next to Pabi Ben is a bag that she created using the sort of trimmings and ribbons that she would have um, otherwise embroidered on her blouse uh, as an adaptation to this uh, decree from the elders. But she created this bag that then got christened the Pabi bag. And this bag has traveled all over the world and is exported through an organization called Kalaraksha in Kutch. Two years ago, Pabi Ben decided to leave Kalaraksha and stand on her own two feet with the support of her husband, Lakman. And an extraordinary thing has happened. Not only have artisans like her gained a new confidence, a new self-esteem, a new worth for what they're doing and a new value, but what's happened is the earnings. So she's planning her new home as we speak. The first year, she earned 15 lakhs in sales. This for a woman, she said she used to walk long distances as a 10-year-old, you know, growing up, to earn just a rupee to help someone carry water from the well. The value of money, and imagine the incredible um, productivity that she has generated for herself, but also she has 10 sewing machines and she employs 50 women like herself, and the number's only growing. So stories like this abound, and I'm very happy that some, at some point we become touch points in what we're doing for these kinds of stories of hope. But one last thing that the UN also has its goal is responsible consumption. Consumption by people like you and I who can make a difference make an impact on the environment, make an impact to the way in which we're consuming things, and make an impact to livelihoods like Bobby Ben's. What is it going to take? We need to very carefully look at what we are consuming and what we're wearing. Think about the impact that, that is produced when you wear synthetics. Man-made processes take a lot of fossil fuels and carbon emissions are the result. So let's talk about handmade. The next time you go out shopping, I want to challenge you. I want to urge you to think about what you're going to be adding to your wardrobe. And I'm suggesting that you think about some of these things. Where does it come from? How long does it, did it take to get there? Did it take a long time? Did it take a long way, in which case shipping and transportation was involved? In which case um, you, were, you were spending a very high carbon footprint? Is it made locally? 
What is it made of? Is it made with natural fibers or is it synthetic? How is it made? Is it giving someone a skilled livelihood? Who is it made by? Do they take pride in their work? Do they get due credit? And I thought I would especially wear the sari today that this weaver Dayal Albai has woven um, to give him credit. It comes from Kutch. What is their living and working conditions? In this case, you can see Dayal Albai is doing well enough to have a motorbike. What is in it for the next generation? Will it make a difference to someone's life? What does it cost you and what does it cost the person who's making it? Does it just look good or is it truly handmade? Does it feel good as well? Be careful and beware of imitations because as the handmade begins to trend, there are as many people and more who are not making handmade and who are looking, making the look and the feel of handmade. And finally, does it connect to you as an Indian in a globalized world? Remember that people are not looking for yet another t-shirt around the world. In the stores in um, Tokyo and Hong Kong, Bombay, London, New York, San Francisco, people are looking for something unique. Is it a craft technique that's special to India? Is it something that is different from global competition? And how long will it last? Is it going to be timeless? This is important that it doesn't end up in the landfill. So the next time you think of buying something, think about some of these things. And I'm sure that you'll not only look good, but you'll feel good and you'll be doing good. Thank you.